So uh, wonderful that you are back. We know that people are leaving on a Friday, but we have a very interesting session and uh, very important topics to be discussed. I'm asked to stand up on this because I, even though I'm not a very small person, I prefer to not see. So uh, I would like to start uh, with a few words before I get in our distinguished speakers. The future of higher education in an interconnected and global context. I think that that is what we actually have been brought to the table all through the conference in different ways and on different perspectives. The pandemic, the invasion of Ukraine, the climate change, et cetera, have clearly shown, and there is and a greater awareness of that the global challenges are something that is a concern of all of us. That the global challenges we are facing need corporations around the world. Also, we have listened to many uh, uh, speakers here talking about the SDGs. And I would once again say that all the SDGs are interconnected. It's important that we always see that there is an interconnection between them. And of course, they are connected to the Agenda 2030. And I would also highlight again that actually Agenda 2030 was ratified by 193 countries. There is a government uh, responsibility for actually making this come true. And in addition, the United Nations have clearly declared that the key role of higher education in bringing this to realizations. To meet the challenges, to equip all societies to meet local needs, where we know that there is a large diversity in the needs, in the local need, and in the global context that we also need to have interdisciplinarity, which has been raised. And I would like again to say that we cannot just focus on the STEM area, that is very important, but we need all the other disciplines. We need humanity, we need social science, we need performing art. All these are needed to actually go and see, meet the global challenges. We need a collaboration between universities, between within universities and between universities, but also between the universities and the public, private sector, the civic society, of course, politicians and policymakers. And this has also been raised during the days we have listened to different sessions. Two, in collaboration and cohesion, we meet the challenges to transform to sustainable society of local relevance and partners locally and global relevance. And I say that the, the local relevance, because I think that the most of the partnership uh, uh, cooperation will be in local and regional vicinities. I also see SDGs as a common platform of, uh, for not just the higher education sector. The uh, Agenda 2030 is also a platform for other stakeholders in society. So we share this in common. So how to develop cooperation, which has to be built on mutual trust and respect for each stakeholder's prerequisites and the higher education core values are those fundamental principles that all stakeholders also have to respect in the cooperation. So now we have three um, speakers from different regions and we will listen to their views and discuss and then afterwards discuss. So I will start with Patrick Dean, who is currently the principal of Queen's University of Canada, a position he has held since 2019. And before that, he served nine years as president and vice chancellor of McMaster University of Canada. He has a deep commitment to social justice and transformation. And his commitment to global engagement comes together with his advocacy for academic freedom and autonomy. And he currently serves for the, for, for, as president for the governing council of the observatory Magna Carta. So please come forward, Patrick. Thanks very much. I am enjoying this platform. It's very good. And 
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to have been invited to speak, especially uh, at the end of such a fine and stimulating conference. Um, I'm deliberately not using PowerPoint slides, and this is not just because I'm a caricature professor of English and mistrustful of such things, um, but because I thought it would be most useful to use the time given to me this morning to reflect on some of the themes that have come up in the conference and to talk about the idea of cooperation and to address in a very frank way some of the challenges that I think we all face in building a future that is premised on a high degree of cooperation between institutions, between systems, between universities and government and society and so on. Um, the last thing I'll say by way of preface to my comments is that I'm I'm not known to be an overly optimistic person, um, but I am very optimistic uh, after this conference. And I say this to you because by the time I'm finished speaking, you might be very depressed. Um, it's hard not to be optimistic about the future of higher education uh, in a global context. Uh, from the conference over the, these last three days, um, we've had some very compelling evidence uh, of a number of issues. The consensus in the global academy around the SDGs, for example, that is in fact a very heartening thing to see. Um, we heard on Wednesday a brilliantly articulated vision for a transformational uh, higher education agenda uh, in Antonio Navo's presentation. We've in other sessions had a very powerful picture of student expectations and the role students can play in this, uh, this future vision. We had another session in which uh, uh, we saw some of the ways in which knowledge systems are being opened up and unlocked in a way that enables a broader participation in the work of the academy globally. All of this uh, very, very encouraging. Uh, it makes me feel uh, very privileged to have leadership of an academic institution at a time like this. It is a time of far-reaching change. Um, I'm remembering uh, Fernando Leon Garcia's diagram that he put up, I think, yesterday, which showed uh, amongst university leaders uh, two things. A very high conviction that this is a moment for transformation and change. And then you'll remember the other part of that diagram was, uh, I think, about 60% you know, of university leaders pointing to things that were already happening that were evidence of change. So I think that does provide some substance to the assertion we all make uh, uh, that this is an unprecedented time. I mean, every, every age thinks of itself as unprecedented in the degree of change. But after COVID, I think, and in the face of climate change, there is a reason to talk about this as an unprecedented time of change, requiring unprecedented measures from the university community to address uh, the challenges that the world faces. It's also a time in which uh, we feel a sense of the profound interconnectedness of communities and people and institutions around the world. The negative side of this, of course, is what COVID teaches us, which is that things are communicable, negative things. And the positive side, of course, is that positive things are also communicable where the networks exist. Um, but it is important uh, to, to focus on that notion of interconnectedness. Now, there seems no doubt about the lessons that have been learned from, from the sense of interconnectedness at the time. The future of higher education and the societies we serve will depend on our ability to make the most of our interconnectedness. And here I get into really what I want to say in, in the time available to me. Interconnectedness means different things and presents different opportunities to universities in different parts of the world. Inter our, a sense of interconnectedness and the acknowledgement of that is more important to institutions in some parts of the world than in others. And this is a point we should not gloss over. The rhetoric of international collaboration and cooperation and interconnectedness is profoundly compelling. 
especially in the present context, which Pam alluded to, a time in which global conflict is more and more prominent, the, the threat of the use of nuclear weapons is, is uh, there every day. Um, that rhetoric about connectedness and how we must build upon it and, and reinforce it is profoundly compelling. We all want to believe it. But it's important to acknowledge the problematic dimension of high, uh, interconnectedness in the higher education sector, especially if we recognize that our futures depend upon it. Now, on Tuesday, uh, Roberta Escalante Semerena pointed to a fault line in our thinking about interconnectedness when he noted that there were profound failures in international cooperation in our attempts to address COVID. Uh, uh, Ernest Ariete pushed back, suggested there was evidence of cooperation between Oxford and African universities in the development of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, all of which was very valid. But of course, the point that R Roberta was prompting us to consider is that pre-existing global inequities meant that those habits of mind, self-protection, the cultivation of the self and of profit prevailed to a disturbing degree uh, in the development of COVID vaccines over the issue of sharing intellectual property and the sharing of vaccines around the world. What, of course, is most disturbing about that is what greater crisis does humanity face than an epidemic that can uh, potentially extinguish the population, and yet the profit motive was still alive and well in those discussions. So today I want to talk about international cooperation and some of the realities we need to confront and address if the future of higher education in an interconnected and global context is to be what we hope and want it to be. We are interdependent. Quite a few presenters have used that word interdependent. Um, uh, much to my, my delight this, for this week. Um, we are interdependent, even if we do not all acknowledge it. Another way of putting this is to say that interdependent is what we are. Deliberately interconnected is what we need to become if we are to realize the future we want for ourselves, for our students, for our institutions, our communities, and the people of this planet. So now I'm going to turn to speak specifically as a North American colleague to you all. And I alluded to what I wanted to say a couple of days ago when I was pleased to receive the badge from the uh, Internationalization Strate Strategy Advisory Service. There is a very significant proportion of the global academy from which I come that does not necessarily see its fortune and future in equitable and mutually beneficial partnerships with the rest of the world. I think it is just important to say that. Um, the other day I, I mentioned, uh, or at least commented upon the remarkably small number of North American institutions who are members of the IAU. It's actually shocking and real cause con for concern when you consider the number of outstanding higher education institutions that exist in that part of the world. So if our future as a planet depends on the interconnectedness of the greatest minds and the greatest institutions on the planet, it is profoundly perturbing that institutions in a major part sector in, on, on the face of the earth are not participants in this particular discussion. I mean, you might say, so what about this? You can build partnerships of the willing. And, and that's all very well. But if you believe, as I do, that the future of our planet and the species depends upon comprehensive collaborative action and the equitable sharing of resources, intellectual no less than material, that is a problem. But what I said about membership in the IAU is not really the point. The, the issue is membership of universities in the global scholarly community 
and the extent to which they recognize the obligation, the responsibility they have to each other. And at this moment in history, when we've seen global inequities persist and the protection of profit prevail, even when the survival of the species is at stake, I don't believe universities have the option not to recognize that they have responsibilities to each other. And Marta Lasada said something really interesting to me in the break, which really helps. There's a distinction to be made against membership in university associations, formal or informal, in which the concern is the benefit to be the short term and immediate benefits to be derived from membership. That's one way of conceiving of membership. There is another, and that's to think of membership as an opportunity to contribute, to give rather than to receive. And that is an important distinction that I believe is lost on many of my colleagues. I don't want to um, say that the phenomenon I'm describing is unique to North America, but it is a particular aspect of North American culture. You might say it derives from Ralph Waldo Emerson, if you want, the famous essay on reliance, self-reliance. Um, but there is a persisting strain of self-reliance in North American culture, and it produces, and it is propped up by, the spirit of competition. And those two things, self-reliance and the competitive spirit, in turn, make the amassing rather than the sharing of resources, the natural predisposition of the culture. I'm, I'm being very critical, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things, but my intention is to point to the fact that as we reach towards that wonderful vision, reimagining our futures together and building a new social contract for education, we should not fail to notice the elephant in the room, self-interest, self-interest. We heard from Antonio Navoa on Wednesday about the need to move away from models for higher education derived from business. But simply wishing the modernization of higher education away will not actually make that happen. Yesterday, we had a very small group to discuss the whole issue of increasing inequalities between higher education systems. I thought that was an interesting revelation of the extent to which global inequities are at the center of our concern as we think about cooperation and collaboration going forward. Because, of course, self-interest is what um, lies at the heart of those inequities. Perhaps, I'm going to put this a different way, the richest higher education system in the world is not here. And that is a real cause for concern and something we have to address. If collaboration is to be successfully the way forward for our institutions. Um, I wanted to point to this because I do think we need to name it as a problem. Uh, there is a danger with proceeding as if that is not uh, an obstacle that could derail everything we have in our strategy as an association and in our thoughts as people who aspire to a greater world order. I'm going to leave it there. But I'd be very interested in hearing from all of you about ways in which that can be addressed, uh, what it means to address that, and what kind of transformation is required within our institutions, because the phenomenon I've described is not unique to my culture. It is internalized in the organization of my institution, and similar internalizations I, I know are to be discerned around the globe. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, Patrick, and we will discuss this. And I, I'm happy that you're an optimist, even though the, the words to come was very much of challenges, but I, I hope that we can go away with optimism. So the next speaker in this session is Professor Nana Abba 
Ampu, that's right, correct. And she is since 2021, the first female vice chancellor at the University of Ghana. She's an experienced academic and university administrator with over 20 years of experience in the higher education sector. She's driven by two key notions in all operations of her university, technology as an enabler and a devotion to human welfare. She has numerous experience from working with many organizations in Africa and also international. I welcome you to the board. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for keeping faith with us to the end. This is a pretty decent uh, crowd for the end of a conference like this. I'm particularly glad that I could make it because exactly a week ago, I lost my mom and my first instinct was to drop out. Uh, but I'm happy that I made it and also got onto the board. Uh, so this morning, together with my colleagues here, we are sharing perspectives on the future of higher education in an interconnected and global context. Uh, over the past few days, we've listened to thought-provoking discussions and I would like to commend the earlier speakers on their insightful presentations, which has uh, provided a foundation, a foundation for the final discussion today. Now, before I go into the main discussion of uh, the theme, I've had a few people ask me about my university. So I thought that I will uh, start this by um, an introduction to my university, especially for those who missed the conference in 2017. And so we were established uh, 74 years ago as a University College of, Kip, of, of the Gold Coast. We have actually launched our 75th anniversary, which is uh, next year. Our mission is to create an enabling environment that makes the university increasingly relevant to national and global development, which I believe we are, we've been talking about here at this conference through cutting edge research, as well as high quality teaching and learning. And uh, our comparative strengths uh, cover biomedical research, communicable and non-communicable diseases, plant breeding, food processing and production, so food security generally, climate change adaptation, uh, development policy and poverty monitoring and evaluation and ethics, arts and culture. And so the two main guiding questions for this presentation is what's the future of international cooperation and how can we bring about coherence, build synergies and amplify the significance of higher education to the society? And to answer these, I pose three further questions which would guide uh, my talk. That is, what is the role and relevance of higher education? What are our current global challenges? And how do we connect the global to the local and the local to the global? Yes. So the role and relevance of higher education has uh, been a subject of debate for uh, many years but nonetheless i believe that no matter your orientation we can agree on the these broad uh, deliveries of higher education so at the personal level we can talk about personal development goals and this involves training the next generation of scholars and also equipping individuals with employable skills and i'm talking about problem solving skills, critical learning skills, and uh, communication. Now, at the national levels, we expected to be agents of change. And so we engage in research to address the challenges of our societies. And then at the global level, we collaborate to address global challenges. Uh, in effect, higher education is expected 
to solve the world's problems. Now, the world has been, so before that, I, uh, I was inducted into office a year ago, and uh, as part of my induction speech, I indicated that my goal as vice chancellor uh, would be for the university to train students who are critical thinkers, who are technologically adept, humane, culturally sensitive, and ready to provide leadership for the country and the continent, and that I'll be focusing on developing 21st century citizenry skills of our students. And I believe that we are all doing this in various ways, uh, wherever we find ourselves in leadership in higher education. Now, what are the uh, challenges that we are confronted with globally? The world indeed is confronted with a number of challenges which political leadership is expected to resolve. Yet we see a recent crisis in political leadership all over the world, in different parts of the world, coming up in different forms, yet there is a political crisis. And uh, the world looks up to higher education institutions to provide uh, solutions to these challenges. The, so I'll talk about just four of these challenges. The first one is uh, climate change or climate crisis. Now, climate change and its attendant risk to our ecosystems and humans resulting in biodiversity, bi biodiversity losses, species extinctions, risk to cities and settlements remain a major threat to our lives and is a source of global concern. And I must say that it doesn't matter where on the earth you live, the impact of climate change is evident to us all. Now, the second uh, current global challenge that I'd like to mention is food uh, insecurity. The 2022 Global Report on Food Crisis indicated that close to 193 million people are experiencing acute food insecurity. Uh, climate change or weather-related disasters is one of the causes of food insecurity. And we can also talk about economic shocks and high rising uh, global food prices, especially in this post COVID era. And I'm happy to uh, indicate that the world is recognizing the role that academia or higher education has to play in resolving these challenges. The Africa Food Prize 2022 went to a professor at the University of Ghana, my institution, who is the director of the West African Center for Crop Improvement at the University of Ghana, Professor Eric Dankwa. And he was awarded for his outstanding expertise, leadership and grantsmanship skills that led to the establishment and development of WACI as a world-class center for training plant breeders in Africa for Africa. So academia has a critical role to play in these uh, challenges. And just a brief about the, the center, uh, it's interesting to note that it started out as a partnership between the University of Ghana and Cornell University in 2007 with funding from AGRA, the initial funding from AGRA uh, to train plant breeders in Africa. Since then, it has leveraged on this, got funding from several other institutions and is currently one of the three World Bank Africa Centers of Excellence at the University of Ghana. It's trained 105 PhD students, a number of master's students, and currently has over 80 graduate students. And its activities focuses on 18 African countries, including those uh, listed. Now, the next challenge, the third one I'd like to talk about is uh, war, conflict, and displacement. As of May 2022, 6 million people have fled the war in Ukraine, which is said to be the fastest growing refugee crisis. There's displacement in Somalia due to drought. And between January and April this year, 36,000 refugees from Nigeria, Mali, and Burkina Faso arrived in Niger. Now, all over the globe, when there are wars, conflicts, and displacement, women and children are at increased risk of violence, trafficking, and death. And so that's something that runs common among uh, conflicts and displacement. It doesn't matter where in the world that you are. Now, the final uh, global crisis that I would mention is uh, 
COVID-19. COVID now, we all know that it was declared a global pandemic in uh, 2020, and the effects therefore knows no bounds. We have issues of major economic recovery disparities we've seen in various countries. We have in this conference talked about vaccine distribution and hesitancy. And then also we saw the vulnerability of healthcare systems, not just in least developed countries, but also even in developed countries such as the United States. And the uh, WHO boss, Dr. Brayesus, uh, in talking about lessons for dealing with future pandemics, talked, mentioned that science has to guide policy. And I would say that research has to guide policy. Also that science must pair with equity or it can actually make inequities worse. And that's why I say that disciplines need to work together. Scientists must collaborate with social scientists and arts and humanities scholars in understanding the issues of the world. We need to have more coherent global plans to how to respond to a pandemic and then investment in research, investment in research also a critical one there. And here I'd like to uh, talk about our West Africa Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, which is one of the World Bank African Centers of Excellence at the University of Ghana, led by faculty from the Department of Biomed Biochemistry, Cell and Molecular Biology, and the Niguchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research for Medical Research, both at the University of Ghana. What was there? Uh, contribution. They were involved in genome sequencing uh, because they are already in genome research, uh, had the funding, had the resources, had the expertise. We had, they only had to redirect their attention to the COVID pandemic. And then also they did a seroprevalence studies. And to date, it is the largest in uh, Africa, and that's to detect uh, anti antibodies. And that helped us to also know the real situation on the ground with regard to people who had been infected. And uh, clearly from this end, the numbers uh, were far higher than being uh, reported. And I, I suppose that the difference was in the, uh, the extent of uh, disease among the infected. And uh, I remember Ernest talking uh, two days ago about the vaccine uh, hub. Yes, that is the case, but I must admit that uh, the center at this point feels that the boat has uh, sailed, and so there isn't uh, much effort being put into the vaccine research. Although initially we, we, we were working on vaccines for malaria, which is still ongoing. And so I would like to uh, conclude by uh, talking about connecting the global to the local and the local to the global. So first, we need to recognize the global nature of our challenges, and that will allow individual institutions not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, second, we need to understand that the measures we put in place to address these challenges have to be contextualized locally. And so we cannot uh, import wholesale solutions to other uh, places around the world. And then said local and global expertise and capacities have to be recognized. In this conference, we've heard about the interesting things that are happening in different parts of, of, of the world. And we can leverage on these in our partnerships and our collaborations. The IAU uh, having members from yesterday, I had 130 countries provides us with an avenue to collaborate, having identified our common priorities. And finally, I would like to say that for us to achieve meaningful results while optimizing our resources, which includes time and expertise, uh, building synergies and collaboration is the way forward. We do not have any, way, any other way out of this. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing also other perspectives and, and showing the diversity which we had to handle. And um, finally, I would like to ask Padu, 
Puri to come to the stage. The 16th president of the American University of Beirut since 2015. He was professor and chairman of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology, Emory University School of Medicine, and held the Roberto, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but the Guachueta Distinguished Chair for Cancer Research. He also served as a deputy director for the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University. Dr. Khoury was also the executive or associate dean for the research of the Moore University School of Medicine. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Ilga and Trina for persuading me to come. It's been wonderful. Dublin was actually at the top of my bucket list. And uh, it's been a very interesting conference. I put a timer for myself because I'm always late. I'll try to be efficient. But I tried to take a little bit of a different approach, talk about the American University of Beirut and how we're responding to the challenge of internationalizations and the sense of urgency we have. So I'm going to start by the strengths uh, of universities in general, the American University of Beirut in particular, I feel good about this because for the first time in my life, I'm actually six foot tall, uh, thanks to this stand. But I think for us as a 156 year old university, strong uh, mission and vision oriented brand that's been repeatedly challenged. We have high quality committed faculty and staff, transformative education that has to keep evolving to meet student and faculty and staff needs, which I'm going to talk about uh, the rankings. I'm not a ranking, a believer, I would say I'm beyond agnostic. I'm probably a ranking critic, uh, but I'll talk about the importance of that. It's critical to have a campus. I'm not sold that we can move to online education wholly. There is something about the university experience. Solid financial standing has never been important since the last, as the last few years, where I'll show you some of the things we've faced and global outreach. Uh, for us, the death threat is being considered a Lebanese university. It's not a question of snobism, but since we produce about 63% of the tier one research in the country. No other country in the global south has such a heavy burden. We carry a much heavier base. And the last few years have been a real challenge. So we need to remain a global university, both in perspective uh, and enroll while serving the local community. So this is uh, the university founded in 1866, one of the 25 most beautiful or so the only rankings I care about say, bastion of liberal values, diversity and tolerance, empowers future citizen leaders. It's graduated generations of leaders and innovators, more than two dozen uh, premiers or deputy premiers and senior leaders in Jordan alone, in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan alone, not to say in Lebanon, pioneering research, world-class uh, medical center. And we would love to one day host an an IAU uh, meeting uh, once things are close, a little calmer. So I'm going to play a video about the founding of the American University of Beirut to put it in a little in bit. In 1864, the state of New York officially charters the Syrian Protestant College, SPC. In December 1866, the Syrian Protestant College opens its doors in the residential area of Sahel Blot to the first generation of 16 students. The first professors, all missionaries, perfect the Arabic language to spread the word of God. They teach all subjects in Arabic. The fundamental part of the colleges established in 1867, the medical school. Dr. Cornelius Van Dyke is one of the first medical professors, along with Dr. George Post, the first to sedate a human patient in Lebanon, and Dr. John Wardeman, professor of anatomy and physiology. The first class graduates in 1870. Soon enough, the need to expand beyond the small rented space becomes pressing. Bliss and David Stewart Dodge, son of William, discover the ideal location. The plot is near the tip of Ras Beirut, a rocky headland pushing out to the Mediterranean Sea, only accessible by cactus lanes and stony donkey paths. The founders buy the desolate patch of land for $8,000. In 1871, 
William E. Dodge, now the treasurer of SPC's Board of Trustees, lays the cornerstone for College Hall. At the inauguration of College Hall, President Bliss proclaims the institution's principles and high ideals, defining its ethos for generations to come. This college is for all conditions and classes of men, without regard to color, nationality, race, or religion. But it will be impossible for anyone to continue with us long without knowing what we believe to be the truth and our reasons for that belief. So, Patrick, like Queens, the University of Beirut was founded by Presbyterian missionaries. But they had a crisis in 1882 where the speaker for the commencement, a devout Presbyterian, brings up Charles Darwin. And six months later, that professor is expelled. The students turn, there are mass student protests, and many of those faculty members who founded the university leave. They were actually European and American, but they taught in Arabic. And the university took the early turn to secular humanism as the basis of teaching. So now almost 140 years after that incident, how are we operating in a global environment to bring on persistent, meaningful societal benefit contributed to a better future while staying true to our mission, which is to advance knowledge with the broadest possible audience. We've done it with regard to societal impact over generations. These are just four of the leaders. Faris al Khouri is really the founding leader of the modern state of Syria. He wrote the charter. Angela Jardat Khouri, the first woman UN representative and one of the lead authors of the UN uh, statutes on human rights, the UN charter. Hagop Akiskal, a medical graduate, has redefined mood disorders, depression, and others, perhaps the most seminal psychiatric researcher of the last 50 years or among the short list. And Huda Zogbi is our latest winner, a graduate to win the Kavli Prize. That's the top prize in neuroscience equivalent to the Nobel. So we've contributed to knowledge, we've contributed to societies. And yet, how do we be more, how can we remain more purposeful? And over the last seven years, we've put together a strategic vision called VITAL, which is based on valuing our community, sharing our values consistently, integrating not just technology, but a humanities and purpose-based education to transform the university experience. We have the students for three, four, five, seven years. We want to see how we can help them become the best versions of their selves. All of that without compromising research, doing research in quality rather than quantity, a challenge in today's uh, tenurable world, and finally lifting the quality of health and medicine across our region. So now you'll hear my skepticism about rankings, but it is not uh, a complete uh, dismissal. Where do the rankings matter? Well, the rankings provide data, something I found out about more than 20 years ago when I moved from MD Anderson to Emory and saw, went from the leading cancer institution to the world to one that was unranked. They do have data. And for us, the data that matters is how are our students doing? So from that perspective, our students get jobs. And as Trina was asking me, they don't just get jobs in their specialties, right? Hilga ironically asked the same question. They get jobs in different sectors and they leave with the intention for social impact. So that's very important for us. The latest rankings on sustainability, there's some interesting data. It's not just important to be to be ranked highly because I think this is frankly marketing and much of it paid for. We don't pay, but uh, I'm sad to say some of our others do. It actually teaches you about your strengths and weaknesses. We've lost some of our uh, international faculty because of the last three years. So our diversity is down. We're good in equality, but we can be better. Knowledge exchange, which is something I'm going to focus on in a little bit. Impact, life quality, and sustainable education all against the background of being in the country that according to a recent UN study has the second unhappiest people in the world after only Afghanistan. So that sets a challenge for us, but challenges can be made into opportunities. I do think accreditation is important. It's not uh, the be all and end all, but there are so many universities mushrooming in the world that accreditation sets a certain minimal standard, I would say, sometimes reasonable standards, on what universities are doing to walk the talk with regard to their educational mission. And particularly our engineering uh, faculty, but also 
are public health, uh, business, and other faculties have all the accreditation, including our medical school, which has just about every accreditation it, it has, which is important. But also remarkably, our faculty are getting grants. So uh, this is particularly relevant for me because of not just the diversity of the sources, but 2022 saw our second largest number of total grants, lar largest number of research grants. And these were grants written during the worst year of the pandemic. So the faculty stayed home. They hit on 35% of their grants while dealing with the mental challenges of being isolated. And this helps uh, keep our mission going. But uh, we've also had a very intentional strategy for university partnerships. So since I arrived uh, more than seven years ago, we've focused on universities, not just in the US, you'll see in a little bit, AUB is an American university chartered in New York has been very, very American centric. But we've had relations that we've built with Johns Hopkins and others in the US, but also with Trinity College where I'm visiting this afternoon, Peking University, uh, Michigan, uh, and a number of universities in the global north and global south. And we're building our relations out in Africa through our ties uh, via MasterCard. And particularly, uh, some of those ties are deepening. And this is the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. I believe uh, most of the folks on the stage have collaborations. Uh, for us, this was critical. Our first stage, uh, we had just 63 undergraduates in one faculty in the Faculty of Health Sciences. We were being trialed out. And these had to be individuals who came from financially challenged backgrounds, but were aspirational. Then once we did that, we moved on to the second phase where half the students actually come from sub-Saharan Africa, from 10 countries in Africa. And we've had a component of Syrian refugees. Why Syrian refugees? Well, Lebanon has the highest per capita number of refugees in the world. Right now with about 5.1 million people total, about one and a half million of them are refugees, either Syrian or Palestinian. And so the opportunities we've been able to, to create are considerable. Uh, we also have started to reach out into Latin America. We got a grant from the um, Kellogg Foundation for us to help four universities, three in Mexico, one in Haiti, become uh, more uh, focused on ethical and value-based uh, leadership, social entrepreneurship, uh, entre uh, experiential learning, problem solving, and university engagement with the communities. And I was in Guadalajara one month ago to see the progress of the first three years. And it's actually quite impressive, particularly impressive when you see the student testimonies and see what they've been able to accomplish with some guidance. We've also emphasized the liberal arts and the humanities. This has been very, very important for us. Uh, my arguments, and I hope I'm not offending anyone in our recent uh, trip to Kigali about uh, six weeks ago, with many of the smaller universities, I'm not talking about uh, the University of Ghana, is if you focus it all on technology and on innovation, where are you gonna get your ethical leaders? College is the chance to expose them to the classics, the classics from different continents. And in our collaborations with Cyprus and our collaborations with Africa, we've started to get more Afrocentric, more Greek, more uh, global humanities while increasing the Arabic humanities component. And this is a wonderful grant from Mellon that not only provides funding for our writers and scholars, but it also allows us to go in depth in terms of the value of local humanities. And this is our network. I commissioned uh, when I started as president in 2015, a study, five-year study, which finished in 2020, to show the faculty what we understood. That yes, our predominant collaborations, of course, are with the US and then with, with Canada, but we've substantially increased those, not only with Britain and France, but as you can see with China, Mexico, Australia, Finland, South Korea is growing, and also in the Arab world. AUB had always felt that it was above collaborating with the universities of the Arab world. And for the last five years, we've approached the uh, universities in the global South, be they in Africa, in uh, Asia, in Latin America, or, or in the MENA region with a more collegiate approach. And uh, we've also started to be true to the thing that I've said for many years. Look, you can be a jack of all trades or you can focus on a few areas. 
So we've raised about $10 million to focus in these five areas that I see as critical enablers of uh, future research. Inequalities in social justice, the Mediterranean Sea, sustainability, health innovation policy, and intelligence and insights. And these will lead to centers of excellence that will be seeded for, by presidential funds that we've raised. But eventually they're expected to be sustainable. This money is for faculty recruitment, but also for empowerment of the faculty that are there. But it's again, it's all ultimately about the students. We have 62 agreements in Europe alone for student mobility, 25 in North America. The types are generally bilateral exchange and MOU. You'll notice that uh, Europe is significantly more because only our Canadian and Mexican collaborations result in students coming to us, Patrick. The, the US universities, the kids will come, but they'll come on their own. The problem is that the US State Department keeps amplifying the, the warnings on traveling to Lebanon, making it even for universities that we have strong collaborations with like Harvard, Yale, and Hopkins, impossible for them to ensure their students. So this has resulted in even now this fall semester, the 500 students that we graduated early, 22% of them remain international despite everything that's happened to Lebanon, non-Lebanese. And of course, what's happened to Lebanon is a anus or anus catastrophes, uh, everything, government failure, port of Beirut explosion, COVID, which at one point was controlled because no one uh, trusted the government, but this devastating port explosion, fourth largest non-nuclear explosion of the last 120 years, resulted in a loss of about 380 faculty members. 30% of our professorial track faculty have left. Some have been replaced. Several are coming back. The currency devalued, debt default by a government that was clueless, led by a prime minister who formerly was one of my direct reports, so we'll accept some responsibility there. A banking sector collapsed. Uh, all of this to say an economic crisis that the World Bank rates as one of the three worst since the original Great Depression, which started in Germany in the 1870s. So this has been a particularly challenging time, but I believe the university has responded. Despite seeing our student revenues drop from 183 million to 15 million, uh, really when you're making 7.5% of the revenues you were three years ago, you typically close and, and quit while you're ahead, but we've mobilized parts of our endowment. Our students were among the leaders in rebuilding and uh, responding, we had the highest response rate to trauma uh, of all the university hospitals, of all the hospitals for the explosion. And they've been celebrated for that. But I want to draw attention to this picture at the bottom uh, right, just behind Patrick. So even through all of this, we've held set, set up nine unit schools, K through 12, for Syrian refugee students. This is in partnership with an NGO. So it's important to continue to serve even in difficult times, but it's also important to diversify. Uh, very quickly, we have a wide range of online education that we're offering, some for fee, some for degree, some for diploma, some, some gratis, uh, to bring in a different audience because I think universities are evolving so that our group is not only the 18 to 35 year olds, but perhaps the 14 to 95 year olds who want continuing education. And by diversifying the revenue streams in the offering, we're reducing pressure on the college kids and the medical and graduate students. And part of that is frankly, founding new physical campuses. For the first time in years, uh, first time ever, we're opening a new campus in Cyprus, potentially another one in the Arabian Gulf. That will admit students. This was sponsored by the mayor of Paphos and strong support from the president of Cyprus. Uh, we're actually building that campus uh, ourselves and we'll start admitting students next fall. Uh, and we're trying to do all of this in a global context and I'm wrapping up in the next minute or two. For us, the roadmap for a new era of higher education was very well described at the World Higher Education Conference. It's about inclusion, equity, and pluralism. Academic freedom, which may be easier in Beirut is not so, and easier in Cyprus, not so easy in the Gulf. We've pushed the limits of our agreements and we think we have one of the stronger academic freedom agreements in that region. Inquiry, critical uh, thinking and creativity have to be at the heart of a university education, as does the continuous reinforcement of integrity and ethics. University, college, and even graduate school is where you go 
to make mistakes and learn from them as long as you learn the lessons. And a punitive approach, in my opinion, is not a successful one. Commitments to sustainability and social responsibility and excellence through cooperation rather than ambition. Uh, two men who've long been committed to internationalization and long work, John Larson, who is one of the few people in uh, the US Congress who pushed globalization when globalization became a word for people to rally uh, nativism against, uh, as he mentions, is not a monolithic force, but an evolving set of consequences, some good, some bad, and some intended. This is a new reality. This is one of the individuals that helped protect US government funding for AUD because there's a strong inwardness in each of our countries, which says, let me worry about myself and global situations, let's leave them to someone else. But Kofi Annan spoke well when he said, it's been said that arguing against globalization is like arguing against the laws of gravity. I'm not sure I agree with him because people are making a compelling argument. We believe globalization is inevitable, but it is not an easy struggle. And with that, I'll say thank you. And I came in under my 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for all this, um, let's say, important things to discuss and also to consider. And I would really like the audience to be involved in the discussions, but uh, since you uh, think about your questions or you maybe have them, I would like to raise, um, I have many, but I will raise one. And that is, are universities self-confident enough to take on the role and to be the part saying that we have a key role to play in the society. How do we get the people within the universities, our students, our faculties, to, be, to have the same mindsets? It's my belief, and I would like to hear you, it's my belief that if we don't get the faculties on, if we don't get the students on, we can discuss among the leaders, we can make agreements, and there is a lot of agreements, never taking actions at all. So I would like each of you to make reflections. Are we self-confident enough to be the drivers? Well, thanks, Pam, for giving me the opportunity to be optimistic. Um, uh, I actually profoundly believe there is that confidence now. Um, I wouldn't always have said that, but I've watched in my own institution, uh, there's a great hunger amongst faculty to feel that the work they do matters, whether they're literary scholars or, or people in the health sciences, it doesn't matter. There is a desire to understand how they can be effective and how their disciplinary and interdisciplinary work can, can feed into the greater good. Uh, and I've, so I've seen a university over three years move from being unhappy because it had no sense of direction, being passionate about these issues. This is one area in which the SDGs have done a huge service because they provide a taxonomy for these hugely complex institutions to find and to identify the areas in which faculty members can, can have effect. So I'm extremely optimistic about that. Uh, as to students, they are the hope of us all and the, you know, the power and the momentum of student concern about global justice issues, climate change and so on. This is very, it's a powerful animating force in the university. Um, the way I feel at the moment is, you know, set up the conditions for people to do the work they want to do and get out of the way and let them do it and not try to control too much how their work will express itself because it will have impact. I see my own responsibility as working at the institutional level to build partnerships that facilitate that, that work. So I, I, I do believe there is, I, not sure I would call it confidence, I would prefer to call it resolve. I, I think there's powerful resolve on, on these issues. Um, so I think Patrick said a lot of it. I will, I'll say it a little bit differently. I think the role of the university administrator is best defined by the late William Sloan Coffin, who of course was the firebrand 
uh, uh, sort of Parson, the, the, the Presbyterian minister of Yale during the Vietnam War, he said, grace is about, God's grace is about maximal support, minimum intervention. I think university leaders we can encourage, we can set a broad direction, but if the faculty and the students don't see this as something they're passionate about, something they're excited about, it's going nowhere. Uh, the agreements that I talked about all came from the faculty. Not one was our reaching out, uh, whether in the global south or the global north. It, were, it was a series of things that grew based on opportunities for bilateral student exchange and for faculty collaborations. And I think that's the only way forward. Thank you. I thank you. I Pam, I agree with the, the two earlier speakers that there is enough resolve, there is enough self-confidence. The leadership of universities, as we have seen here in this uh, conference, are ready to provide the avenue for working together, for collaborating. And I do absolutely agree that the work is to be done by the faculty and the students. I have uh, in the past few days uh, interacted with people, been approached, oh, let's uh, get an MOU signed and so on. But I've said that, look, there was a time at my university where we had hundreds of MOU signed, but nothing was happening. And I don't want to uh, continue in that way. Uh, for me, it is best for, for me to connect you with the right person in the faculty, in the colleges, in the departments, so that they work with people in your institution. And on the basis of that, we can have an agreement that truly works. And so that's what the leader is expected to do. And then the faculty are also encouraged to get students on in these agreements, to get students to participate in our research, to get students to be involved in our advocacy and our community engagements. So I do absolutely agree that there's a resolve, but we need the students and the faculty to do the work. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, the panelists. Thank you for the rich ideas that you have brought forward. I would, like, I would be interested in looking at how you can strengthen the issues of two, two cross-cutting issues in higher education. One is inequality, which you mentioned, but uh, it, it is ongoing. We are aware of it, but it cuts across genders, it cuts across socioeconomic levels, it cuts across the, the resources like digital accessibility technology. And the second bit of it is that all of this undermines quality assurance so that the type of quality of higher education which we must address, even if we have access, but there is the issue of quality. How do we address them in the future so that we bridge these gaps, which actually have a COVID pandemic showed that they could even be getting bigger. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. So I, I think the question of inequality is a central one for universities. I mean, for us in a decade, we've gone from an institution which was largely a private American institution that took students who could pay to about 64% of our students being on financial aid at a mean of 55%, even as our revenues have come down. And I think that's critical for the educational experience. For the students themselves and for the faculty, they need to teach and learn from diverse uh, students, not just diverse internationally, but diverse socioeconomically. And I have to say it's a constant struggle but if you leave college uh, as you left high school with an experience with kids who are like you, then we've failed and you've failed. So that's critical. For quality assurance, 
uh, I tried to make the point quickly. Nobody can do everything really well. And that's why we pushed this out, those five areas, Pam, that uh, we chose as priorities to seed fund. Those were chosen by a broad group of faculty and students and validated by trustee engagement. Uh, even Harvard, which is richer than half the countries in the world, right, Patrick? Uh, they don't do everything well. They just founded a school of engineering, which I find laughable since they're down the street for, for arguably the greatest engineering institution in the, in the world, MIT. So for us, it's about focus. If you do everything, your quality is going to drop. If you choose the things you do well and make sure that you're not reviewing yourself, but you're getting important external validation and critique, you're much more likely to have meaningful quality assurance. Right. Okay, so while the issue of uh, inequality is uh, real, and uh, as uh, leaders in higher education, uh, we need to be seen to be addressing these. And I believe that a way of doing this is uh, for institutions to be able to identify their strengths, uh, their resources and also their inefficiencies. And so these are the things that we take into our partnerships, uh, knowing what you are good at, knowing the resources that you have and your expectation of what your partners are also bringing on board. And so we go into equal uh, partnerships. We don't go into partnerships where the idea is that we are going to receive and receive and receive, and it's nothing that we can give. I believe that, I mean, of course, they, they, they are institutions, they are countries which are richer than others, but I do believe that in every context and then in every consortium, you would find that each member, if we have critically assessed ourselves, will know the strengths that we will bring to the table, and we will also know uh, inefficiencies for which we are seeking uh, for help. On the issue of uh, quality assurance, which of course uh, cuts across uh, all the areas, we need as individual institutions to have our systems in place and also to learn from others and to benefit from what others are doing uh, better. Yes, the issue of uh, specialization, as you have uh, mentioned, is uh, one to consider, but you also need to consider your context and what is expected of you as a higher education institution within your uh, community and deliver appropriately. Thank you. Um, on the global inequalities issue, I mean, I think finding an answer to global inequality is not the condition of our doing our work, it's the object of our work. It's the goal, so uh, in the long term. So the issue for me is how we build alliances and connections between institutions and networks of institutions that actually do not exacerbate the discrepancies in wealth around the world and in fact help, help us find solutions. I look for a, an analogy to current thinking about community engaged teaching and research where it's incumbent on universities to take their cue from the community partner about the issues that need to be addressed and the approach that should be taken so that it is a collaborative mutual process which gives rise to a solution that benefits the community and also is within the ambit of the university and its mission if you translate that to international university collaborative terms it means that we build networks that in some sense can get around the problem of inequalities by focusing them on issues that matter to the country that is facing the problem but doesn't have resources to deal with them. And I think that's a critical way in which networks can begin to reimagine that they don't, it's not a matter of the wealthy setting the agenda for the collaboration. I think that's the key point. And if I could then just say a word about the quality issue, um, I agree with everything my colleagues have said here, but I would add one thing, and that's the importance of remembering that quality is not defined in a singular God-given way across the globe. 
So in approaching this issue, there are local determinants which have to weigh in from which you understand policy and the enforcement. And this is my problem with what I was saying there. Um, there are forms of dominance over the global academy that emanate from the wealthy parts of the globe that dictate what policy is, what excellence is, and what should be rewarded. And that, in the end, is an impediment to the long-term goal of what we profess all to be working for. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm still with Barbara. Mr. Perdue. Yes, thank you. Well, when one is uh, confronted with the idea of discussing the future of higher education, um, uh, has to adopt different attitudes, I mean, towards that. One is, uh, as uh, Tom was saying, not, not to be pessimistic, but as, at the same time, I would say we will have to be realistic. And uh, uh, I maintain the, the the utopia. I mean, as well. I, I think that is important. In my view, uh, the future of higher education, by by and large, lies or is a dependent variable of how the world is evolving. Unfortunately, I mean, we have not been able to decouple, if I could say so, the way in which higher education goes and how the society and, uh, and we have many examples of how how the world is going and how the higher education is going i mean there are uh, proposals that uh, universities should disappear we don't need universities now i mean the big multinational telecommunication companies say i mean google and so on and so forth which is the trend in which the way is going, I mean, can substitute uh, universities. And we, so we don't, we don't need uh, universities. And so, but we don't agree with that. Uh, we disagree with that. And uh, we study and research and teach, I mean, other things. Uh, and that is good, that, that, that is important. But we have to go a bit further, uh, in my view. How could I put it? I mean, we have to leave our offices and our labs. I mean, we have to do, I mean, of course, we have to be there and do the, all the experiments and, and uh, do the literature to uh, reviews and publish to the books and articles and so on. But as Patrick was saying, I mean, we have to go and ally ourselves with those that are pushed in the wrong way by how society is going. And uh, I, I finish. I, I finish in a, in a, in a, in a second. Uh, so what I want to say is that we have to, um, to um, rebel against the academia a uh, normal way of thinking and doing. I mean, we have to do something else. Otherwise, we will be a dependent variable of how things go and things are not going well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, since I was in Qatar University. Question is, uh, Dr. Khoury, but of course, you know, Please feel free to pitch in. Um, you know, uh, Lebanon, it's not the first time we go into a crisis, and uh, AUB has always been, uh, you know, able to overcome all the crises we've went, gone through uh, through all these years, especially the 15 years war, campus divided, uh, not being able to go from side to side. But this is the first time that, uh, you know, our globalization in terms of AUB puts us out of the country. Um, of course, it's, it makes me feel as a Lebanese, make me, make me feel secure that you have such a nice uh, you know, future, optimistic future. But I want you to tell me uh, as a Lebanese, you know, how strongly do you believe that this is possible? I mean, there is as much as a country can take. You just show, showed a slide that has a blast that is uh, the biggest in history, non-nuclear, the financial crisis. So I just want you to uh, let me know. And of course, you know, the other panelists might have 
uh, hopefully lesser problems, but also uh, with uh, the same perspective. So if you can just elaborate and make me feel sure and secure about the future. I have one more question, and then we can ask other questions. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, I'm also happy to see the professor from American University of Peru. You have uh, a lot of Somalis uh, in Peru and now helping our government in the sector of the health. So thank you very much for giving the opportunity for Somalis. Uh, and we all know that uh, collaboration is a uh, contributor to the success of the SDGs. And so we have two two problems for sorry, and when it comes for collaboration with universities, uh, for example, we do collaborate uh, at the top level, and that and then we both aside at least from their presidents and then the international office. So I think without communication with the DNS and other colleges this will not be an effective way to go ahead for the second thing when i am coming to the conference i already sit with the tennis before i come and discuss it i said hey guys this is the speakers that will be in that uh, conference who we need to benefit from them so as to discuss with him because we already selected some uh, universities that we need to collaborate some already accepted thanks to them and the others are uh, in discussion so i think uh, preliminary uh, discussion with the team yeah uh, it builds the activities for ahead and when it comes for uh, signing the mous uh, communicating back to them it helps also and and the last thing monitoring and evaluation of the mous because uh, five years or three years, and when it finished, oh, let us renew you, something like that. But it needs a continuous uh, uh, monitoring to see where we are and where we go to the MOUs that is already signed. Thank you very much. All right, yeah, thank you. So um, thank you uh, very much uh, for, for your uh, contributions uh, are letting us that uh, while we maintain the utopia, we need to uh, remain uh, realistic. But what I would like to say is that higher education institutions exist in societies, in communities. And uh, very often, like you mentioned, we are a reflection of the societies in which we exist. However, it seems to me that there is a higher expectation for higher education institutions. And so that's why sometimes uh, people within our communities are surprised to find that the very things that are existing in the society also exist in the universities. So they are amazed to hear if there is corruption in the university. It's, it's, it's amazing for them. So that tells us that there is a higher expectation from, from us and people are really looking up to us to provide solutions to the challenges in the communities. So definitely we have to push the limits for ourselves and be the standards for others to look up to. And uh, I mean, I'll leave the second question for you to address. I, I, I don't have a comment on that. But yes, uh, collaboration can be initiated at various levels. It can be initiated at the very top, and then it can be initiated among you know, the other officers, uh, deans, and even faculty uh, members. But I agree with you that there has to be cohesion and there has to be uh, uh, communication and coordination. Otherwise, if you have a university like mine, a very big and complex one, you know, uh, 61,000 students, more than 6,000 staff, you may end up with thousands of MOUs sitting in your international uh, uh, programs office and not very much going on on the ground. 
Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to pick up something Roberto said to answer Cesar and then end with just briefly, then we'll use them, we'll try to do it efficiently. Uh, yes, we have to be realistic, Roberto. We can only do so much, but we have to do much more than we used to do, right? Uh, I think what this crisis has shown with the availability of online learning is that if we don't change, we're going to become irrelevant. All of us, not just the universities in, in Lebanon, Cesar. So, uh, you know, the academy, uh, we've been wearing these priests robes for a thousand years and now students are challenging that and saying, hey, where's my value? Including in MOUs, right? Including, so it's at the end, I think, I feel very proud of the university that I've been honored to serve. And I'm getting close to the halfway point of my second term because it's about a journey of self-transformation, Cesar. And that journey of self-transformation is also about being realistic. The Lebanese have had the immigration instinct for 200 years. 200 years, the Lebanese have gotten to the ports of Beirut, Tripoli, Sidon, and left. At crises, they leave. So you cannot change a society overnight. However, what you can do is inject a sense of citizenship and, and a sense of ownership in your students and the society. In our latest student election, with everything going on, 51% of the students who are eligible actually voted. And the biggest winners were the independent parties, despite Quite frankly, the local political parties pouring money and intimidation into student campaigns. They got four out of 20 students in this student body, 16 independent candidates. So what does that mean? That means our job ultimately as universities is to encourage and empower citizen leaders. And that's what New York University of Beirut is about. That's what all of our universities have to be about. We have to be about the person who could be our child, right? Leaving that university more confident, more self-aware, more empowered than when they entered. We're not going to be 100% successful, but if we're not successful the overwhelming majority of time, and we didn't really have a session on mental health, which I think is a critical component, then we have failed and we will be replaced by Google. Uh, and I say this on the day when Elon Musk closed the, 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 the purchase outright of Twitter, and fired its top four executives. So if we don't see the threat coming from monopolies of knowledge ownership, then we've been asleep too long. The time to act is now. I, I don't have too much to add. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with what's been said about make, make, ensuring that MOU is meaningful, because of course those, those relationships are the crux of, of uh, collaborative relationships. Um, on the question of how much faith you can have in an optimistic future in the teeth of what you've seen is the reality in Lebanon. I mean, I, Roberto said it. I mean, you have to be realistic, but you also have to keep your eyes on utopia. Otherwise, what's the point? So you really do have to keep looking for ways to bend that divergence uh, in, in a more productive way for humanity. And what I would say is, I mean, it's it hasn't always been the assumption of universities that they should exert an influence on society, but certainly for the last couple of hundred years, there has been that tacit assumption that we have an effect. What there hasn't been as much as there is now is an understanding that we need to be more active in the way we exercise that ability to affect society. And here I speak as the, the, the chair of the Magna Carta um, Governing Council. There's nothing in the principles that underwrite the historical conception of a university that militates against active involvement and engagement in society. That's why things like community engaged learning and research, you know, uh, a, a very kind of bold vision for taking the work of the university across national borders, all of that is really, I would say, in keeping with the proper mission of universities. We're just not, Roberta, we're just not bold enough about doing it. And right now the stakes are very high. We'd better get moving. Thank you very much. And I don't think I open the floor for one more question because from a health issue, we have been sitting for one and a half hour and we'll have one, one last session. But 
I usually uh, want to ask for a take home message. And in this case, I would like you to express very shortly the take home message for the new board of the IAU to bring forward. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for me, the take home from the, the conference and from the session in particular is that collaboration is the way forward for us for higher education institutions. And in our collaboration, we need to recognize our comparative strengths, resources. We need to go to the table recognizing that every member of the collaborative team has something to uh, contribute in as much as a number of challenges facing us are global, we need to realize that the implementation of the solutions need to be localized. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I would reiterate that point about collaboration. So my take home would be take nothing for granted in thinking about this, and especially take nothing for granted about yourselves and your own institutions. My advice would be, what is required is actually a systemic and almost an epistemological shift in the way we think about the work of universities. And we internalize some of the very things we see as the obstacle to the work of the universities. We, we, Yes, we are complicit in our own frustration. Look inwards. Okay. Uh, to be brief, I'm going to be a little controversial and say one of my favorite movies, arguably my favorite, is Diarios de Motocicletas, which is the biography of Che Guevara when he was a young physician. And he tours Latin America as a third year medical student. I'm not yet and with his friend Alberto Granado, and he discovers something, which is that the people of Latin America are basically one people. And this is something I think for IAU to push. We are one group of universities. We have a shared mission. You know that, of course, Patrick made a critical uh, point about self-interest, but there are ways to align that self-interest because if we don't align that self-interest and the moment is now to better serve the core mission, of educating and empowering future leaders, I think we will have missed potentially our greatest opportunity. Thank you very much. I think that was a good ending of this session and a good end. I'm not going to open for more questions because it's already a very short comment. Uh, to mitigate the sufferings and the miseries of the world, uh, I think we must remember what Dostoevsky said, everyone is responsible to everyone for everything. And universities are more responsible. So with this, I want you to make an applaud for this fantastic panel. And for the take home message.